Hey everyone, welcome to this Lighthouse Experience. The Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. And if there's anything we know about God, when He makes anything, He feels it. He made man and filled it with His glory. So if He made it today for you, then He has filled it with the Word from heaven that is going to change your life. Service has started, the table is, the table is set, and it's time for us to go have some church. I believe God has a Word for you that can change your life. Welcome to another Lighthouse Worship Experience. We're so glad you are joining us here online today. So it's prayer time in the sanctuary, and I don't know about you, but I just feel a sweet presence in this place. And I pray that you would feel that sweet presence in your room or, or in, in the kitchen or wherever you are driving in the car. I pray that you would feel that sweet presence and that aroma of the Holy Spirit right where you are. So let's go to God in prayer and let's lift up the name of Jesus. Father, we glorify you and we thank you on today, oh God. Father, we come beholding who you are in your glory. Father, we know that you are the creator and the maker of heaven and earth. Father, we know that we shall come to you and submit all of our plans, ideas, and things that we have desired in our heart to you, O oh God. Father, we know that you continue to make all things well within us. Father, we ask that you would continue to keep us in perfect peace, O oh God. Father, we know that in ourselves, O oh God, that we don't have the answers, but in you, O oh God, you have all of the answers that we need, O oh God. So, Father, continue to comfort us by your spirit. Continue to lead us by your spirit. Continue to guide us by your truth and by your word, O oh God. Let every man be a lie, O oh God, but let your word and let you be the truth, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we know that we're living in a day and age where confusion is heavy and confusion is high, O oh God. So, Father, we ask that you would give us your truth, O oh God, your truth that endures through all generations, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we need your word. We need your word to live. We need your word to eat. We need your word to move, oh God. So, Father, we ask that you would give us a release in the spirit. Give us a release in everything that we do, oh God, so that we may glorify you in perfect and in and, 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 and awesome ways, oh God. In Jesus' name, we do pray and we give you thanks and we say amen. Hallelujah. We welcome you wherever you may be tonight to worship with us. The name that's above every name. Jesus, we call on your name tonight for you are most worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let your glory fall in this place, God. You were the word.
it is. The name of Jesus Christ, our King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful. Of Jesus. The name of Jesus, Christ, what, a name. what a powerful name, nothing compares, nothing compares to me. what a powerful what name, a powerful name the name of Jesus, what a powerful name, the name of Jesus, what a powerful name. Jesus, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. We can rest in your name. The name of Jesus. We can stand on your name. The name of Jesus. That's power in your name. The name of Jesus. Oh, the name of Jesus. Come on, that's your place to worship. The name of Jesus. Oh, we worship the name. Hey everybody, as promised, we're here yet again on another Tuesday, and I got the same group in different seats, but I got the same group with me because I believe there was an anointing that's been flowing with us for the last few weeks, and I'm so grateful uh, to have you here with us on yet another Tackle the Text. Uh, to my right, I've got Pastor Matt, uh, next to him, Pastor Rama, and next to him, Pastor Hammond. How you guys doing? Good, hey man. Good, it's good. good to see you guys good. again. Uh, thank y'all for coming back because I thought y'all weren't going to make it. You know, I didn't hear from y'all for a couple of days and I thought <laughs> that y'all, and I invited you on TV. Yep. And I intended if y'all didn't show up, I was going to ask the audience. Y'all y'all heard him say they was coming. Plans. Yeah, man, but I don't have to because y'all kept your word. Wasn't going to get me. I was going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I'm, I'm excited about today's discussion. Um, it's, it's an Old Testament discussion, right? Exodus 14, um, and, and I'll just, for context, to catch everybody up, um, the Lord spoke unto Moses, and he says, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Piharath between Migdal and the sea, over against Belzephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. And this is really talking about all of these different cities. It's really talking about how God took them for what could have been a straight path and a straight shot to get to the promised land. He takes them and they go to Piharath between Migdal and over against the Sea of Bel Zephon. And, and they, this is what I call a perplexing path about how 
yes, God can get you there sooner. And yes, God can get you there easier. But what happens when he decides through his infinite wisdom to intentionally make the path perplexing? What, do, what, what does it mean when God says, I could get you from Canaan, from the Red Sea to Canaan, and I can do it on a straight shot, but I'm going to take, take you the long way around. I guess I want to start the conversation uh, with you, Matt, because I know your sports background. And you had a goal, and that goal was to play in the NFL. And, and if I'm correct, I think you tried out for just about every team in the NFL. That's the long way around. Would you say your path was perplexing? One. And two, what do you say to people who are saying, man, I'm just trying to make the team, but why do I have to try out for every one of them? Well, that's good. Um, I would say perplexing is, is probably a, a, an understatement. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, we're talking about two knee, two knee injuries. You know, season ending, both on the fir first uh, first game of the season in different times. Um, just like you said, turns left and right. So perplexing is a word. Um, I would say that draining was even more of the word. Um, to continuously go through um, adversity over and over, it can drain you. But two, what would I say is just goes back to what we talked about last week. That process, that word has been sitting in my, in my spirit for mm -hmm. a long time. That process prepared me. I couldn't, if I would have got to that promise to the NFL, the first go around, I wouldn't be sitting in this chair. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be with my wife. I wouldn't be, I'd be a completely different person. So going to these different cities, so to say, going through these different obstacles, what it did is it, at every stop, I lost a part of the old me and I gained a part of this new me. And if it wouldn't have been for every single stop, I can't say where I would be. Pastor Rama, you come, you, you've lived in Nigeria, uh, you've had human resource experience, you've worked Fortune 500 companies, your last company was purchased by another company, and then you're presented with new, um, a new boss who does it a different way, and they're letting everybody go, and, and you don't know if you're going to be in that process, not to mention uh, you being at another church, and, and then God bringing you to leading a campus at another church. You have been through a perplexing path yourself. What would you say to people who've had many stops and, and how to keep your, uh, give me a word, your energy or your faith up when, when God doesn't give you the straight shot? So thank you very much, Pastor, for, for that. Um, I, think, I think for me, I, I, I try to connect purpose to everything that happens in my life. That's my default setting. So no matter what happens, no matter where I am, I always like to connect purpose to everything and anything I'm doing. Um, and I think that um, I, just thinking about, thinking about the whole conversation about Israel, the whole conversation about the text, everything, I see, I see some of myself in what they went through. Um, I see different components. I see all the mountains. I see all the things they had to go through. I see, the, I see even the pharaoh. And one thing about Pharaoh, and I know um, it might be just off, but one thing about Pharaoh is that um, Pharaoh made it also difficult for them. Why, why do I bring up Pharaoh? Because um, the Holy Spirit just told me that Pharaoh is really someone that, that needs you but doesn't love you. Um, Pharaoh, is someone, <laughs> Pharaoh is someone that, wow. that needs your help but doesn't help your need. That's awesome. That's um, because the moment they left, Pharaoh said, hold on a second, we got to go bring them back. Not because there was a heart connection, because there was a hand connection. They, he just loved what they did for him. So I, I think that God has helped me to be able to just understand. And, and Pastor, this is one thing that has helped me through all of this. Because you talked about losing a piece of you yeah. um, in every season. God has helped me to understand. Do, do you know that transformation are causing transition, but disconnection are causing transition? When God knows that your loyalty, or when God knows that your sensitivity, rather, is actually very low, he, he makes sure you keep going in circles because you have the wrong people in your circle. And because the, the wrong people in your circle don't have the character equity. They don't have the substance to go the distance. So God actually allows you to go because everybody that left everybody that left Egypt was not everybody that went into the promised land. So God is going to make sure you keep going through all of this because he knows that difficulty will reveal this loyalty. Man, you should have been a rapper cuz you can you can just 
say words and match, match them and rhyme them, I think it's amazing. You know, I thought, I thought when you said that about losing pieces of yourself, and then I'm going to toss to you, Pastor Hammond. I, I think of a, a space shuttle. You know, just recently, uh, SpaceX sent uh, a shuttle into outer space. And when it was on the ground, it had the rocket boosters, it had the capsule, it had all of the things. But then when it, when it shot up and got into the second heaven or the next atmosphere, it sheds the rocket boosters. And it still has the thrusters and it has... Yes, then it gets into outer space and then it sheds. sheds another part of it because there was only a portion of you really designed to make it. All of the other stuff that you lost, wow. it was engineered to fall off. Yeah. Oof. It's not a mistake that it fell off. It's not an accident that it fell off. It was actually engineered. It was ordained. I like that word better. It was ordained that it fall off. And whenever you see things falling off, that should be an indicator to you that you've changed levels. Come on. As long as you stay on the ground, you need the boosters. But when you get into the place where there's no gravity, you need a thruster. And don't ever, don't ever misinterpret the booster for the thruster. That there are some things in your life that will boost you in one season and, and certain things will thrust you in another. And, and it, is not, it is not God being asleep at the wheel because you lost certain things. I just wow. thought it was important right there to let you know that that's the way God engineered it. It was supposed to fall off on that day, in that year, at that moment. And you, like me, you were supposed to hurt your knee in that moment. When I tore my ACL, Matt, I heard it in my ear. I heard it. Everybody who's been through that knows it. I heard this pop. How do you hear this pop in this ear? I heard it. I heard it. I heard it more than I felt it. The feeling of tearing an ACL only hurts a moment. The rehab was the, was the killer. Wow. It wasn't the injury. It was the rehab, but I heard it. And then God said to me, he said, son, you were trying to play basketball. I was trying to build a man and a preacher. So I had to shift what you cared about so that I could shift what I cared about. Yeah. God will always go to the thing you walk on so that he can influence the thing that he can transform you through. If a man is going to be changed, it has to be by the renewing of his mind. God, I can't change you through your knee, but I can change you through your head. Wow. And so I'll shift the area that you care about so I can shift the area that I care about. And that's the long way around. Pastor Hammond, you come from Virginia. Uh, you've been in denominational ministry. You started your own church. You shifted to being a campus pastor. You've been married 25 plus years. You've got two uh, nearly grown children. You come all the way from the East Coast to this southern city. Your, 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 your job and career change. You've been through all of that, that perplexing path. Why didn't God send Damon Hammond on a straight shot? What do you say to people who have many stops? Pastor, I'd say you, you have to endure the process through the destination. Because I think that every stop is not a stop to get off on. But you got to understand that if you're on, on the, the destination that God is taking you to, you got to realize when it's your appointed time. Don't, don't kill me right now. Because sometimes. Don't make me run out of here. Sometimes we get off. You're from Chicago area, so you've been, on the, you've been on the L. L you, yeah. you, you know, you can get off prematurely, and that's not your stop. And you will lose so much time and distance because now you got to go and, and get on another train to get back lost time. And I think sometimes we abort the process of enduring along the long way around through the destination because that process is will take us to our destiny. You're going to make me run out of here because I just, everybody just type it. Every stop ain't your stop. Wow. Every stop ain't, there is nothing for you at that exit. <laughs> you, there, there is no station for you off of that ramp. That, that ain't your stop. I wish y'all heard what he said. I, I hope that you're not listening to us doing something else because I know you can be distracted and you'll miss the power of a moment. Did you hear the words that came out of his mouth? Every stop isn't your stop. And if you get off at the wrong stop, you have to wait on the next vessel. And there is no guarantee that the next vessel that shows up is going to your stop. Come on. 
You can, I, I used to have to ride the city bus. All of them don't go to the same place. Some of them have routes, and, and, ain't, it got, and ain't nothing worse than being on a bus that has to pass your stop but's not designed to stop at your stop. And now you got to look at your stop in the rearview mirror because you got off at a stop that was not yours. I think that's awesome. The next thing we see, and, and, I, and let me say this, I think, I think that God, do, do you all agree that God sometimes does things and he makes it strange on purpose? I mean... If God was looking for clarity, why would he tell them to bring him water when they was asking for wine? If God was looking for clarity, why would he tell a man who's been on the bed for 38 years, <laughs> rise up and walk? If God was looking for clarity, why would he tell a man with a withered hand to stretch it out? And if he was looking for clarity, here's the, here's the kicker. You, you all get this. If I'm trying to see why would you go tell me to put mud on my eyes? Is God looking for clarity? I think that God intentionally makes it strange. Because God is trying to find out if you want the miracle or do you want me? If you read Exodus chapter 16 verse 4, I believe five of the most powerful words that I've ever seen in the scripture. God is telling them, I'm taking you from Migdal to Baal, Zephon, to Pihaharith, to Migdal. Watch this. That I may prove you. Now, I know all of y'all holy. I know none of y'all don't drink, but they do. I heard they measure alcohol in proof. I heard it. I don't know nothing about it. By volume. I, yeah, I heard through the grapevine that they measured in proof. Um, and proof proves how much strength is in it. What if God is just trying to label your proof? What if he's just trying to prove you? What if he's just trying to get you to see your own strength? Can you endure Pihaharith, Migdal, Belzephan? Can you endure torn ACL, and then another knee injury, and then a failed tryout? Can you endure losing your job and being fired and being a single parent? Can you endure a cultural barrier and, and a language barrier and, and having a wife? And Can you endure switching coast and switching field? Can you endure? I don't know, but, but I think that God is telling you, I'm doing all of this to build up your endurance. Yes. I want to see how long you can run, how far you can go, because if you build up the endurance in the wilderness, you are earning the milk and the honey in the promised land. And I think that's so good. Different from place to place, like you said, it increases your endurance, which means that you were weaker at one point. It means that if you were put in the position earlier, you would have failed. And I think it's in Exodus, the 13th chapter. It says that there was a shorter way, like you said, to Canaan. But God didn't take them through there because he knew that, that he feared that if they would have f uh, faced battle too early, that they would have returned back to Egypt. I was talking to my trainer the other day, Matt. He said, I was telling him, I was like, man, you make us uh, sprint and, and jog so long. You know, it's always 1,600 meters, and it's always 30 minutes on this. And I'm like, man, it goes so long. He says, because when you sprint, you don't have to think about oxygen. <laughs> he says, oxygen is only used in the, in the long run and it's the only thing that builds up endurance and if God is trying to build up our endurance then he knows that he cannot put us on a 40 yard dash because anybody can run 40 yards you don't have to be in shape for you don't have to build up endurance because it's going to be over but give me a 1600 give me a 1600 give me a marathon you got to build up your endurance to finish and the race doesn't go to the swift nor the strong but the one who endures to the end. He says, listen, I want you all to go, and I want you to go all these places, and I'm doing it that I may prove you, and this is going to be a perplexing path, and I'm going to lead you on it. Now, I suspect when I, when I look at the text that God is actually doing two things out of one thing. I think he's doing two things out of one thing. He said, Moses, he's, yes, Moses, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get you out. That's, that's one thing. I'm trying to get you out by taking you the long way around. 
but I'm doing something else. By taking you the long way around, I'm trying to get you out, but I'm also trying to entice Pharaoh in. Because the way I'm taking you, there is a Red Sea. And what you don't know, you're going to be looking at the Red Sea saying, two million of us trying to get through that, most of us are going to die. They had no idea that God was going to part the water. They had no idea that God was going to let them walk through it. And what they actually didn't know is that he was going to have Pharaoh to come in behind them, and he was going to shut the water, and he was going to drown his enemy. Do you all think that sometimes we miss God's real purpose for our Red Seas because we don't agree with the initial purpose of our Red Seas? Amen. I think that's good because I think some pursuits push us. Um, They were pursuing them, but it pushed them into their destiny. I thought about a runner. Uh, you, you're only as fast as what's running after, behind you. If I think about, you talked about the sprint. I think about the, the relay. You, you're, you're running when somebody's coming up behind you. You're trying to win the race. And often God will give us the insight of how to not only run, but run our course mm. and get from the, the long way around and get to our destination. No, I, I think that's um, spot on, Pastor. Um, Pastor, you, when you were preaching, you said God can use one thing to kind of do many things. And that's, that's the God we serve. Because when we see the Red Sea, the Red Sea was really deliverance for the, for the children of Israel, but it was um, death for Pharaoh and, 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 and all his horsemen. As I thought about that, uh, I talked about, and I, I've said this a lot of times about, we have to get God's perspective. Of course, we have to get God's perspective because if you don't see what God sees, you cannot do what God, you cannot, you might, you cannot understand what, why God is doing what he's doing. Yeah. Case in point would be Abraham. Abraham thought he was losing a son, but really he was gaining a nation. Um, <laughs> J- J- Joseph um, and David. Yeah. David thought he was killing a, he was killing a giant without knowing he was he was getting a kingdom. Mm. So I, I think if we can have a God perspective, a God view, um, that's why I always like to say if your perspective is defective, of course you cannot be effective. I, I think we should we should come to a point where we sit down and say. I want to see how you see. A lot of times when things are not working, we think we have to do something. Maybe you just have to see differently. Maybe you don't have to do something different. You just have to see something differently or you have to lose somebody. So, so it's not always about what you have to do. Sometimes is what do you have to see? And I think, I think that you're right. Number one, y- y- y'all heard him rhyme again? Mm. His new rap name is Rhyme Word. Word. <laughs> I think that'd be a good rap name for him as he can always spit bars. Perspective, defective. You've had, you've just, had that a just, thousand just, times. Just Come right on. off the top of his head. Had that Never heard it in my, in my life. Had it <laughs> Hello, my name is Pastor Keon Henderson. I am fortunate enough to give leadership to the Lighthouse Church, and it is giving time. I'm always excited about when it is time to give. Now, let me tell you, as a pastor, it is my responsibility to tell you the benefits of giving. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 12. The Bible says, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I want to speak to your willingness today. I know sometimes people feel insecure because of what they don't have. God says, I'm not looking for what you don't have. I'm looking for you to be willing to give what you don't have, and then I'll accept what you have. God loves a cheerful giver. I want you to get to the place where you are willing to give God the most, even in the season where you have the least. I'm praying that God will open up the floodgates of heaven and let a blessing rain down on your family that will bless you for many generations to come. I believe that this is a season where wealth shall abound to the people of God who trust him with the seed that is in their possession. I believe that this is a shift. I believe a shift is coming. If you're determined to get there, I believe God is going to do it. I want every one of you to get your gifts ready right now. I want you to get it ready because God is already ready to bless. He's not getting ready to do it. He's ready to do it right now. And I believe that he has already released your blessing. Now you have to release it from the storehouse by the seed that you put in the ground. Lighthouse 2.0, I love you. Thank you so much. Those are all of our online members who come from all over the world. And for all of our local members who are watching us online through this pandemic, thank you 
we are here because you have stayed consistent in your obedience to God. Do you have your gift? You ready to go? Are you texting it? Let me know. Are you giving through the app? However you're doing it, I believe that God is going to bless you. Get that gift in your hand and repeat after me as I move towards greater. I will accept all ideas, thoughts, and concepts that will connect me to my destiny. I believe that what Jesus Christ has done for me is bigger than what anyone has, can, or will do to me. Say this like you mean it. Because of his full gift, I will lend to many nations and will borrow from none. If you said that, I pray that God would take the seed that you just released and multiply it 100 times. Get ready for overflow. I believe it. Do you? Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, we're going to go back to tackle the text because I can't wait for you to hear what's next. On, so, so look, God says, I'm, I'm saving you from the Red Sea. It's, it's two and one. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's two and one. It's two and one. I'm saving you from the Red Sea. But if you remember the text, Pharaoh started asking about this God that was delivering them. Yes, sir. So while he is using this as a way of luring the children of Israel out, and he's using it for the purpose of luring Pharaoh in. God has a dual perspective because while God is trying to save them from the Red Sea, he is simultaneously trying to save Pharaoh from the lake of fire. Wow. God has a way of using your trouble to save your enemies. Yeah. Pastor, I thought about that same thing. You talked about using one thing to have multiple meanings. If we go backwards, we understand that uh, when they were, uh, Moses was battling with Pharaoh, uh, God allowed the sea the, in, in Egypt to turn to blood. Yes. And God delivered them. Now they get to this place that's called the Red Sea. Well, let me go back. So the, the river, uh, we go backwards again. Uh, he told them to put the blood on the doorposts to protect them, right? Yeah. Then they get the, the, the rivers had blood, and now they're at the seed of red, right? Wow. So God will begin to allow us to see by way of the blood. The blood is seen not just in color, but we see it in its liquidity, right? It's somebody's seeing it's a, red right it, now. It's somebody's <laughs> seeing red. The so song says the blood that gives me strength for it reaches yeah. the highest mountain flows to the lowest valleys. That blood uh, that gives me strength. Gives me strength from, from day, day to day, day. And it will never, never. ever lose Pastor, its power. Pastor, I, I, I thought about you You really honed into God uses one thing to do different things. Let's flip it around because this is the God we serve. He has mo multiple uses of things. He can do anything. And while we are getting that perspective and introduced to the God in that dimension, maybe we need to also understand that he's the God that can use many things to do one thing. Woo. He can, he can, and I think about it because, yeah, he can use, that's why we say all things work together yes, sir. for good. So he's not just a God that can use one thing to do many things. He he's a God that can things. use many things to do one thing. I, I look it. at the genealogy of Jesus and Mark in, in Matthew chapter one, and we see all the ladies, all the lineage of grace, Rahab, and all these people that had issues. And God used all of that to do one thing, Jesus. I love that, man. I love that. You, you think about this then uh, while you're in that vein. So you are a leader. You are a leader. You are a leader. Many of you all who are watching, you are leaders. And you don't have to have a church to be a leader. If you are a parent, you're a leader. You're a leader. If you are what? A manager? You're a leader. You're a leader. If you're a husband, you're a leader. If you're a husband, you're a leader. You're if you're a, a wife, you're a single, you're a leader. if yep. you're single, you're leaders. leading you. Yep. So the world is full of leaders. Pharaoh and his army hmm. overtook them. Yeah. And they look at Moses, who's the leader, and says, Moses, you brought us out here to die. Yeah. <laughs> we're thirsty. We're hungry. You got these crazy folk chasing us. At least when we were back there, we had food to eat. We had a place to lay. First time I ever thought about this. I never thought about it. Maybe you all have. If they were out there and thirsty and hungry, 
Didn't they ever think that Moses was too? It ain't like Moses had a grocery store that he could go to and get a sandwich and then come back out and struggle with them. It wasn't like he had a reservoir of water that he could go drink from and then come back. He was struggling with them. I think that this is the time for people, and I know that it's a hard thing for them to do, but you got to learn to give grace to your leaders. Yes, sir. I think that's really good. I saw something the other day when I was reading, and it talked about how sheep always blame the shepherd, but never recognize that the shepherd's usually covered in sheep bites. <laughs> you better say it again, sir. You, you know, we, we, we look at the people that are leading us, and, and for people who are in leadership, and, and the, the hard thing is that where do leaders go when we bleed? Because sheep don't like blood. It's okay. It's okay as a sheep if I bleed because I expect you to come and help me. But what happens when you start bleeding? When, 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 with that dynamic, like you said, it's, it's, we have to start giving grace and changing our perspective, like you said, or we won't be able to effectively lead or follow. It's amazing wow. how people will judge that which leads them, but they have no correction for themselves for that which they lead. And, and it's one side. And I, I, I think that we spend so many times on these Tuesdays encouraging followers. But let's just spend a few moments encouraging leaders. How hard it is to lead in real time when, real time. when the COVID rate could go from 5 to 17% without warning and a leader of a company or our, our church, our house, is left to make a split decision without all the information. To that mother at home right now that is raising her children and nobody warned her that 2020 and 2021 was going to turn her into a surrogate school teacher. To that, to that person who has to figure out how to pay the bills and the job ain't trying to figure out how to pay them. There are leaders right now that are in the wilderness being ostracized for the decisions they are making while they struggle with the people who are struggling. Pastor Raymond, I want you to look in that camera. There's a pastor right now who's being judged because he wasn't ready for the pandemic. There is a father right now that is being torn apart. There is, there is a business owner right now, Pastor Raymond. And their business has dropped 60%. And yet, everybody who depends on him is still expecting 100%. What do you say to the person who has to find a way around it? The first thing I would say is weep. Why, why do I use the word weep? Because, and when I say weep, what I mean is you just, you, you just don't try to be extra. Just be human. Go through the emotions. The Bible says we have a high priest that is touched. And, and the thing about leaders is that the reason why God puts you in the same ship, leadership, with everybody you're leading is so that you can feel what they are feeling. Hmm. But it doesn't stop at feeling what they are feeling. You have to understand that even though Jesus wept for Lazarus, he took it a step further. And I want to talk to every leader. It's okay to bleed and lead at the same time. It's okay to weep. It's okay to do all of that, but when all of that is said and done, you have to understand that as a leader, there is a grace that comes on you. Jesus cried. Jesus wept, but he still went forward. This is the grace that comes on the leader. And the Bible says your steps are ordered. So when you put it the first step, somehow you begin to walk on water. And I know it's difficult. And that's why I said it's okay to be normal. It's okay to cry. It's okay to have the same issues. It's okay to be in the same boat. But listen. When you cry about Lazarus, please speak to Lazarus. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't want you to just weep about Lazarus. The difference between you and the follower is that the followers don't have the grace to speak to Lazarus. They can cry about it, but they cannot do anything about it. They can offer consolation, but they cannot offer solution. Yeah. And I want to let you know, wherever you are today, cry about it, but speak to it. I love that. I love about it. I love it. I love it. They get there to the sea. We finish this up. They get there to the sea, Pastor Hammond, and the water is flowing. Now, it's just not Israel. They got the animals with them. They've got their children with them. Now, I, 
I'm sure it was a, a couple two-year-olds that could swim, but <laughs> everybody couldn't swim. What, wasn't it some old ladies out there that didn't have the ability to swim? Some, some older gentlemen? I mean, d- let's not imagine that everybody was in the prime of life. What about the people who were lame and crippled and sickly? What about the people who had COVID-3? Because that was a long time ago. <laughs> What about the people who were struggling with all and now they're at their sea? Can you hear them saying, man, if it ain't one thing? So now I did not come out of 400 years of slavery and 40 years in the wilderness to have to deal with something else. To the natural eye, there is no way of escape. You got the mountains, you got the water, and you got Pharaoh. And there's another unseen barrier called fear and unbelief, which is stronger than Pharaoh, stronger than the water, and stronger than the mountains. And all of a sudden, Moses raises up his hand. This old stick that he's been walking with. Here's that God. That can do multiple things with one thing. Because this stick has been good for Moses to lean on. Now all of Israel is getting ready to lean on this stick. And he stretches forth the stick. And the waters part. And the Lord showed me that in the face of the mountains, in the face of Pharaoh, in the face of fear, and in the face of water, the thing that was going to deliver them was in his hand the entire time. Pastor Hammond, I want you to look in that camera, and I want you to tell some leader, some follower, some business owner, some artist that doesn't think they're going to make it through their Red Sea, I want you to let them know that whatever they need it's in their hands i would tell somebody today that leadership comes alive from the behaviors that are used moses used his hand and he lifted up a rod back in pharaoh's house when they put snakes down on the ground and when moses put his rod down on the ground his rod turned into a snake and it ate their snakes the same rod he lifted when he got to the red sea and he lifted his up your leadership is going to come by the good behaviors that you continue to use and when he lifted it up this time They crossed over. But this time, a snake didn't get swallowed up. Pharaoh got swallowed up in the water. And so I want to let someone know today that your God, the God of salvation, is going to save you by your behavior and by you being the great leader that he's already put on the inside of you because you are a great I am inside of you. Hallelujah. He takes that rod and he sticks it over that water parts. That stick has had a heck of a journey because it goes from Moses' hand to parting the water. And we find out later on that that thing ends up in the Ark of the Covenant. That it was, it was Aaron's rod that had budded in the ark. Look at all of the, look at God using one thing for multiple uses. And then he turns around and uses multiple things for one thing. Moses takes that thing and the waters begin to part. Now, I read something in the book, Matt. It said, Moses didn't part the water. No. That in fact, the children of Israel were not at the Red Sea. They were at something called the Reed Sea. He said the writer got it wrong. (laughs) It wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. And the reason why that matters is because the Reed Sea is ankle deep water. It's it's a huge sea that you can walk through with no problem. An infant can walk through it with no problem. He said, so so this is why I don't trust the Bible, because the Bible is, is flawed, because humans have interpreted it wrong. And this wasn't the Red Sea. This wasn't a raging water. This was a shallow water. But I always found out that criticisms cause more problems than they solve. Because if this is the Reed Sea, and it is shallow water, how do you explain shallow water drowning an entire army that's sitting on top of his chariots? I think that the criticism of Scripture causes more problems than it solves. I want you to look in that camera as we get ready to finish. I want you to tell a person who has been criticized for their perspective. 
somebody who has been criticized for their stance. We've been athletes. For somebody who has been put in a difficult position of trying to be cool with everybody on the squad and keep your hand in the master's hand. What do you tell to the person who has to find their way around misunderstanding and misinterpretation? What I would say would be really simple. It would stay the course even when you don't understand it. They went from place to place expecting to get to a destination sooner than they got. But every time, every time they got to a new place, something new happened. Mm. We see everywhere they went, there was different miracles that happened. And when God got them to the place that they needed to be, the mission of that was complete. The, they never saw Pharaoh again. There was, when they were leaving, Pharaoh was always going to come. He was always existing in the back of their mind. They were free, but they weren't free indeed. Mm. There was something that was on the way. And from place to place, they got closer. And that's what I would just say, stay the course. Do you, do you see this thread, though? Because last week, last week, when David spared Saul, the last thing that Pastor Hammond said is they went to Ziglag, yep. and he never saw Saul again. And here you are saying that once they get through the Red Sea, they never see Pharaoh again. It almost reminds me when God says, if you drink of this water, yes, you will never. You will never thirst again. If you eat of this bread, you will never hunger again. So it seems to me that even though it is difficult, the way to never see your enemies again is to take the path that God has for you, no matter how perplexing it is, rather than taking the straight route, even though it may be easy. It seems to me that the key to ending an enemy is to take God's plan for your life. They never saw Pharaoh again. There's a story, and Pastor Hammond, I'll give you the last word. There's a story about a lady named Shelly Ambrose, who was, and she is, if you look her up, uh, she is one of the most powerful African-American CEOs and, and businesswomen uh, in the history of the world. Um, and she's the former executive uh, for IBM, which uh, is about a $115, $116 billion company in about 170 countries. This woman was one of the executives um, for that company. She's on the, on the board for Verizon and Nordstrom. I wish I could meet her to get free sales service and some free clothes. Uh, no, really, if I met her, I'd ask her more questions. I wouldn't ask her for no phone or no clothes. I'd ask her how she got where she got. But she wanted to be an executive at a company, and they told her that there were no more positions. And um, so let me tell you what she did. She got hired at another company. Now, she's still working there. But she went and interviewed and got hired for a position that she wanted at another company. This sounds like something that you would do, uh, Pastor Hammond. Um, <laughs> she she uh, made her position, and then she went back to them and said she was re resigning. And they said, why? She said, uh, because the position I wanted over here wasn't available. So I went and I found that position at another company, and they hired me for it. And she was so valuable to the organization that the company that told her that that position wasn't available opened up that position for her, and she was able to get hired at the company she wanted to work at and not leave. See, that's what I call finding a way around it. She could have got to that place and found out that they didn't have the position and just decided I'm a woman and I'm black and I'm never going to be able to do that because I can't seem to ascend to that level. She found a way around it. She went to another company, got hired in that position and came back and said, if y'all want to keep me, you got to have the position over here. And they made the position because I'm telling you, finding a way around it, it makes your enemies your footstool. It makes doors open for you. It makes crooked way straight. It makes water flow. I hear the Holy Ghost. It, it makes the baby travail. It, it makes the enemy leave you alone. When you find a way around it, you force your environment to acquiesce to you as opposed to you acquiescing to your environment. You have to find a way around it.
You got to find a way around it. You cannot get to the boulder in the middle of the street and turn around. You cannot get to we don't have the resources and say, you know what? Well, then since they can't do it, I can't do it. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You got to find a way around it. If they fire you, start it. If they stop you, initiate it. If they leave you out, kick a hole in the wall. If they tell you that you're a woman and it don't matter, start it yourself. If they say because you're a minority, we don't do that, you admit there is always a way around it. And the only way the waters will part is you got to show up to the water. You can't, you can't pray in your closet and expect that when you get to the water, the waters are going to part. You pray in your closet and then you go tell the water to move. Or you get up off the boat and you speak to the wind and say, peace, be still. Whatever you do, you have to show, show up, up for the fight. Show up. That is finding a way around it. I, I want to go back to school. I, I hear some of you, you want to go back to school. But you don't have the money. Let, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to find, find a, way around it. a way around it. There's a scholarship somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. There's a scholarship somewhere. Pastor, I got bad credit. Find a way yeah. around it. Yeah. Pastor, I'm getting ready to, to, uh, to lose this car. That's okay. <laughs> well, how am I going to get the next one? God will show you a strategy. Find a way around it. A way Around it, I'm, we're speaking to people who are in front of their pharaohs and their Red Seas. And you have stopped because you are paralyzed by how deep the thing in front of you is. And you've assessed that you cannot make it because you don't have the skill set to deal with that environment. You're not a swimmer, but you're facing water. You don't have a business degree, but God put a business in you. Help me, Holy Ghost. You don't know the first thing about opening a daycare, but God put it in your spirit. You don't know the first thing about having a salon, but God made you an entrepreneur. You don't know the first thing about technology, but you know God put an app in your spirit. What do you do when you are facing the deep waters of an opportunity, but haven't been given the deep revelation of the skill set. What do you do when they tell you you're too old, you're, you're too young, you're, you're not this, you're not that. Oh, you're too experienced or you're inexperienced. I tell you what you do, you find a way around it. Pastor Hammond, look at somebody and I want you with the power of the Holy Ghost. If you began to minister somebody who has a rod in their hand and a sea in their future. And I want you to tell them to raise that rod until it splits wide open. Raise your voice until the noise stops. Raise your fasting until God releases an answer. I want you to look at them because somebody's about to quit. Yes, sir. Somebody's about to give up COVID, economy, politics, plus the personal stuff that they've been dealing with. In spite of all of that, has made somebody want to turn around and go back to Pharaoh because at least there they had a job. At least there, some people always want to go back to Pharaoh because the beating at least feels like you want me. But Pastor Hammond, tell him what Pastor Raymond told him. He said, Pharaoh is somebody who needs you and don't love you. Yeah. Speak to him in the name of Jesus. I would say to you right now that God is calling you that as you were deemed as prey, and while you are yet enduring, God says this is the moment that you need to pray. And when you pray, you allow the principalities of heaven to come down onto earth and to subdue what tried to conquer you. And so tonight I speak to everyone that feels as if something has been chasing them in the wrong way. And I declare and decree that what the devil has sent to destroy you, God is allowing you to cross over and to obtain the promise that he has prescribed for you. For yet there is a promise, and he prophesied before you were formed in your mother's womb, and this time you shall reap if you faint not. Hallelujah. I want you to know that they were all at that Red Sea afraid. But can I tell you, you are at a place in your life where fear will no longer work. Fear don't work on this level. You got to use the rod in your hand. 
Moses took that rod, stretched it forth, and the sea split. On another occasion, that same rod, Moses took that rod and he threw it down on the ground. And the Bible says that that rod became a snake. Listen to me, woman of God. Listen to me, man of God. Here's a revelation. Hear me. When Moses threw the rod on the ground, he received a voice from heaven. And it was God. Listen. He says, Moses, pick the snake up by the tail. Go read your scripture. He says, it's a snake. And most people are afraid to touch things that change forms on them. He says, but pick it up by the tail. I ask myself, God, what is wrong with your instructions? Any snake handler will tell you that if you ever going to have the nerve to touch a snake, by all means, don't grab it by the tail. When you grab a snake by the tail, you leave it with all of its functionality and faculties. And when you grab it by the tail, it can genuflect its body and inflict a bite upon you. And depending on how poisonous it is, you can pay with your life because you grabbed it by the wrong end. But God says, the reason why I told Moses to grab it by the tail is because I wanted him to grab it from the end he could not control. I wanted him to grab it from the end that he could not control so I could show him that I can control the uncontrollable. And when Moses went down and grabbed the snake by the tail, the Bible says that by the time he gets it back up within his peripheral, it is already a rod again. Look at God. Always transforming what's in your hand into something you can use. He'll always turn it into what you need. Don't you be weary in well-doing. I don't care if it's nothing but a few fish and five loaves of bread. If you give it to God, he can feed a multitude. He's going to always take that which is in your hand and turn it into something you can use. And as long as you stay in God's hand, he'll continue to use you. The next time you find yourself facing down an obstacle, please do all of us a favor. Find a way around it. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Wow, what an amazing word we just heard. Do you know that when God gives you his word, he gives you himself? The Bible says God is one with his word. There's so much power in what you just heard. And I always like to say faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I want you to go back, listen to this. I bet there's something you're going to hear that you didn't hear the first time. Because the Bible says God speaks once, but we hear twice. Listen, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to serve you. We're trying to, we're trying to seek God's kingdom. We're trying to expand God's kingdom. And, and a lot of people want to partner with us. They, they've been emailing us, texting us, letting us know. We want to be a part of what God is doing here. And we hear you. And so all the details you need to give is on the bottom of your screen. That is one way we can connect with what God is doing in this season. But maybe you want to take it to the next level. You just, you just don't want to give. You want to be part of what God is doing here. And you want to join what we're doing here. You want to be part of this body. We also have ways you can do that. All the information you need is at the bottom of your screen. Listen, Lighthouse is a place. The, we, we, the Bible tells us that Lighthouse is a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. That's what we are. That's who we are. I want to speak into your life today. Before I leave, I want to speak a word of blessing over you. That God's light will shine upon you. That you will be like a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. That you will leave out the name of this church, the lighthouse. Wherever you go, you will dispel darkness and you bring the light there. Like we always like to say, we love you and there's nothing you can do about it. God bless you.
Hey everybody, what's going on? It's PK here. And listen, I want to tell you that I get so many DMs, so many messages of people saying, Pastor, how can I connect with you? I love your messages, but going through YouTube is kind of difficult. Where can I come to a centralized place? We heard you. And that's why we created Lighthouse 2.0. Lighthouse 2.0 is our tribe. It's our village. It's the place where all of the people who say, I want PK to be my online pastor. And PK says, I want you to be my online member. This is the place where we go, the watering hole, the ecosystem where we all come to grow together. And it is exclusively for you. They're getting ready to put a link up on the screen right now that shows you how you make that exclusive step. And everybody can get in. So you better take first movers advantage and get in while you can fit in. I can't wait to see you inside of 2.0. May God bless you. And let's do this thing for Christ.